I'm Dr. Jacob Larson. This is Read, Write, and Sight. And on this channel, I teach you how to read, write, and cite for your college classes. In this video, we're going to be looking at Google Scholar, which is a free online database uh, to help you find academic sources. So let's get into it. I've been uh, teaching academic research lately for my, my college and my high school students, and this is a resource that anyone can use. Now, there's good things and there's bad things about it. Good thing about it, anyone can access it. It is free. The bad thing is, it's just a search engine with a bunch of really cool features. What it doesn't do is actually host or give you access to everything that it finds, which is not great if you find a source that you don't have access to, but it is great if it gives you access to something you wouldn't have found otherwise. So with that up front, let's get started. All right, if we look at the website, which is scholar.google.com, it's going to look a lot like the Google that we're used to, only we see some slight differences. You can search for articles, you can search for case law. If you click on case law, you know, I'm in Arizona, so it's it's bringing up Arizona courts, federal courts. I can narrow it down from there. I'm not going to be searching for case law, so I'm going to go straight to articles. Now, just like Google, I can search for something and it's going to pull up whatever it can find. But I can also narrow down my search by using a couple of really simple tricks. We call these Boolean operators. Now, if I just search for a story name, so for example, by the waters of Babylon, this is a story I recently taught uh, to my high school students. It's going to pull up a bunch of great things. Now, it brought up 2,890 sources, which is quite a few. But if I take off, if I take off my quotation marks and I search again, there's 59,000 results. Because what quotation marks do is they tell Google, "All right, look for this exact phrase, these words in this order." Whereas if we don't have that, if we just type it in, Google is going to look for the words separately and together and in different combinations. So you get about 30 times more the options. Now I'm going to narrow this down again, but I could even put, say, the author's name, which is uh, Benet. You see him. It's in the first resource there. Well, that narrowed it down to just the story itself, which is a very effective way to find the story, but that's not what we're looking for. Okay, so if I had some other phrase that I wanted to add to it, that could really narrow down the search pretty quickly. But this is probably a good place to start. All right, now if we look at the page, you're going to see this looks a little bit different than Google. One of the things my students pointed out when I was teaching them is uh, there's no pictures, there's no videos. All the things we're used to seeing on Google, they're not there. That aside, it's still showing you the title, link information, a snippet, and it goes on from there. But this is all catered to people who are conducting academic research. So here I see the title, but it also tells me this is a book. Underneath it, it tells me the author, the year it was published, and where they got the information from. In this case, they got it from Google's own uh, book catalog. And then there's a snippet right here. Underneath it, you see a star, a uh, quotation mark, a reference to how many sources Google found that has cited this source, related articles, and different versions of this source. This can all be great information to help you narrow down, speed up, and be more effective in your search for research. Now, let's say I want to find an article that's about By the Waters of Babylon by Stephen Vincent Bonet, but is not the original source. So this doesn't help me. But let's look at the next one. All right. I can see the author is R. Dennis, which is not the original author of the story. So that's a start. I could see that this was published in Journal of Historical Geography, 1988, and they found it through ProQuest. Now this gives me some good information. This is going to be an academic source, 1988. For literature research, years don't matter so much because the literature hasn't changed, whereas like scientific research, years are really going to matter a lot. Um, but it also tells me it's in ProQuest. If I don't have a subscription to access sources on ProQuest, and there's a bunch of different ProQuest databases, 
then I may not be able to access this, but I can click on it and find out for sure. So I open it up, it gives me a document preview, which is uh, the first page of the document, which is gonna be useful in that I can figure out whether this is useful or not. But then again, it's not giving me the actual source. So if I needed the whole source, this isn't gonna help me. I'm gonna have to find another way or find a different resource. But it does give me a little bit to work with. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and back up. And let's look at the next one. By the waters of a death camp, an intertextual reading of Psalm 137, where we get this reference by the waters of Babylon. See, when I when I read the story in the class, my students are like, oh, it sounds like the Bible. Because they that's how they connect the word Babylon. They don't know it's actually a reference. Now, if I click on this, there may be no reference to the actual story that I'm talking about, just the, the scripture reference. And that may not be useful for me, but for this particular source, um, published through Oxford Academic Literature and Theology. I know this is from 2008, and I can see some information. It also tells me I don't have access, and it reminds me, hey, you could just log in, or you could pay gobs of money, which is ridiculous. But that's how academic publishers pay for their work. All right, so let's back out. Um, and the list goes on. Okay, let me show you some of the other features here. Now, if you are logged in to Google, it's going to give you access to your profile and to your library, right? Let's click on library. Library is a way to keep track of your sources. It creates a sort of bibliography or works cited, which is super useful if you're trying to go through things really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and back up. Where did my mouse go? And I'm just going to use click the star on a couple of sources. And then I'm going to go back to my library. And boom, they're suddenly there. So that's what clicking on a star does. It's not like you're not giving a like to the author. And they're like, oh, this is so good. No, what it does is it, it tells it to send it to your library. So when you go here now, instead of looking at, I don't know, 2,000 sources, I'm looking at three. And if I don't like it, well, I can go back and I can just unstar it and it disappears. Now let's look at some of these other things here. If I click on site, it's going to tell me five different ways how to cite this. Yeah, five different ways how to cite this. So if I'm doing an English class, maybe I use MLA. If I'm doing something else, I've got APA, Chicago, Harvard, Vancouver, all different ways to, to cite and the bibliography, the references, the works cited whatever it is that I am looking for. And you can link it directly to these other resources like RefWorks. Or you can just select it and then copy and paste it to your paper. It's incredibly useful. Uh, under here, you can also see related articles, how many other sources Google found that cites this in different versions of the text. You can narrow down by year what you're looking for, but one thing to keep in mind if you start using these resources while you're in the library, it's only going to apply them to what you've starred. So if I go up here, for example, and I try to use my advanced search, if I have the library open, it's only going to search my library. But if I, excuse me, if I back up, go to Google Scholar's homepage, and then use the advanced search, it's going to actually search the entire database. So again, these are ways to narrow down what it is you're looking for. Um, if I can search by all the words that I'm typing in, an exact phrase, at least one of the words, without the words, I can search throughout an entire article, or I can narrow it down to just the title of an article. This is really useful because uh, it's, it's very common in academic publishing for a title to simply summarize what the paper's about. So if I'm looking for a paper that's about by the Waters of Babylon by Stephen Vincent Benet, I could search here and it's going to look just for titles, whether it's there or not, which can really narrow down my search. But one thing we have to keep in mind when it comes to any database search, just because you type something in and something doesn't pop up doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Because maybe you just didn't type in the phrase that they used or you don't know the correct terminology, maybe you misspelled something, maybe you put 
quotation marks when they weren't needed and so on, right? You may need to try multiple different ways, different phrases, until you find all the things that you're looking for. So, it's pretty simple and straightforward, I hope. Um, most databases are going to be similar to this. The difference between Google Scholar and everyone else's, it's free and it's just Google searching the internet for what's out there. Whereas a, a database from your, your institution is going to be looking for what they have access to. So I hope that this video is useful. Again, I'm Dr. Jacob Lartson. This is Read, Write, Insight. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.